In Home and Away, is a teacher's interest in his pupil beyond the call of duty? Chatting up your cute young students. I never thought you had it in you. Where should a teacher draw the line? School's somewhere to pass the time till you get married, right? That sort of chauvinism went out with the arc. Home and Away, tomorrow at 6 on 7. The amazing story of what happens when a young man's lover turns out to be his best friend's mother. Certain Rob Lowe in class Sunday. Good evening. Al Grasby has rejected allegations made today in a Sydney court that link him with a former crime boss, the late Robert Trimboli. A secret witness told the court Trimboli gave Grasby $40,000 in return for favours, including an attempt to cover up the Donald McKay case. Amid extremely tight security, the protected witness codenamed Mr Smith was brought to court to outline allegations against Al Grasby and Jennifer and Giuseppe Sergi, all charged with conspiring to pervert the course of justice. The witness began by detailing his long business association with Robert Trimboli in a heroin racket. In June of 1980, Mr Smith claims Robert Trimboli handed over $20,000 in drug profits to Al Grasby at this Haymarket loading dock. The witness claims he saw Grasby go in, then come out with a bag containing the money. Afterwards, Trimboli allegedly defended the payment, saying to Smith, he's part of the whole caper, he gets paid his dues out of everything that goes on. They want to look after him, he's a man of honour. Two months later, Trimboli allegedly gave Grasby another 20000 saying, folks just fixed up 90% of our problems. Trimboli, it seems, was worried about investigations into the murder of Donald McKay. The drugs boss allegedly told Smith, Grasby's come up with this idea to have the government bury the whole thing. To say our mob never done it, it was all a racial thing. Smith went it makes it look like the McKay family knocked him off themselves. He had this screed drawn up telling the whole bull story and he takes it to this MP and any time one of the McKays opens their mouths they'll be told they're racist. Al Grasby has strongly denied all the allegations. The evidence of Smith, who enjoys a number of indemnities from prosecution, remains unsupported in court. Felicity Moffat, Seven News. Senior trade unionists have spent most of tonight, well, thus far, in talks with Prime Minister Bob Hawke and his key ministers, working out a strategy to give Australian workers a wage increase and tax cuts. Well, they're cleverer than I am. ACTU President Simon Crean went into the meeting wanting a firm indication of when the promised tax cuts would be delivered. The country's top union men started arriving in Canberra this afternoon. New South Wales Labor Council Secretary John McBean was leaving it to others to state the union case. But with the latest opinion poll figures giving John Howard and his opposition a boost, the government has to successfully balance its economic strategy with the demands of the labour force. ACTU leader Simon Crean was looking for guarantees on a wage increase and the timing of tax cuts. And there is not an expectation on our part that the tax cuts will come until the next financial year. However, we do need to know that there is a commitment tax cuts for low and middle income earners um, before we're prepared to commit ourselves to uh, um, the wages system. So therefore, it's important for the government to uh, indicate that the timing may be down the track. That's not a problem in itself, but to indicate that they are genuinely committed to substantial uh, tax cuts. The talks dragged on for some time, but the most likely outcome will be a push for a 6% national wage increase and the promise of tax cuts to come next financial year. Tonight's talks are always expected to be inconclusive. We'll probably know exactly what was decided when the Treasurer brings down the May economic statement detailing the government's plans for business and personal tax cuts and their latest plans for wage restraint. David Jones in Canberra for News World. The federal government has backed down on its threat to act against law, pr law price coal exports to Japan. I think probably what you're thinking is, I am, shouldn't that be low price? 
We'll try it with low price. The federal government has backed down its threat to act against low price coal. No, I prefer law. Sorry, law. Against low price coal exports to Japan. But Energy Minister John Kerrin has warned the industry there must be no retrenchment of coal workers as a result. Mr. Kerrin said that any coal sales outside the contracts will have to be negotiated at a better price. Primary Industry Minister John Kerrin was outraged when several Australian coal exporters accepted Japan's nominal offer of only a US $2.90 per tonne increase for hard coking coal. He even threatened to refuse export approval. Now he's backed down, but on certain conditions. That no coal exporters retrench staff, that all spot sales of coal be negotiated at a higher rate for the next 12 months, and that Japan paid better prices for semi-soft coking coal now being discussed. People in Japan think the Australian government's reactions are ritualistic and I'm just signalling very clearly uh, that that's not going to be so from now on. On uranium, Mr Kerrin's assurances that safeguards covering the export of our yellow cake are watertight has failed to convince anti-uranium politicians in and out of the Labor Party. Democrat Senator Norm Sanders will introduce a private member's bill on safeguards which he claims will be foolproof. And it basically it says we don't ship uranium to any country that makes bombs. The bill will be introduced next week. In Canberra, Fiona Pye, 7 News. The federal government has tonight been accused of wasting up to $50 million a year leasing office accommodation but not using it for up to two years. Opposition housing sp spokesman James Porter claims the leasing scandal is a result of bureaucratic inefficiency. This is 28 Margaret Street, Sydney, and the opposition's housing spokesman, James Porter, claims it's one of the worst examples of taxpayers' money being wasted on dead rent. Mr Porter claims offices here were leased by the government, but it was more than two years before the space was finally occupied. Dead rent cost? Up to $3.6 million. Up to $3.6 million just wasted because they are not doing the fit-out, they are not requiring the fit-out of these buildings to be done at the end of the construction period. Mr Porter produced this leaked computer printout of government leases. It shows office space in Ashfield in Sydney's inner west was leased in May 1986 but wasn't occupied until May last year. Another property at Lithgow was leased in May 1985 but wasn't occupied until August last year. And a property leased in Wollongong as far back as June 1985 was finally occupied only last December. Although most examples are in New South Wales, Mr Porter claims the dead rent problem is a national one. Oh, I'm sure it is. The, the problems that have been identified to me uh, in Sydney, I'm sure, are occur occurring elsewhere. And uh, on our estimate, uh, we're looking at a, a loss of about $50 million a year. For its part, the government claims Mr Porter's figures are rubbery at best. A spokesman told me a short time ago that each year the government pays out $355 million to rent premises right across the country. And of that, $4.5 million is in dead rent. But the spokesman says there are very good reasons for that dead rent being paid and the government's record compares favourably with that of the private sector. David Jones in Canberra for News World. I remember when I worked for a non-commercial government broadcasting network who should remain his name shall remain anonymous for the story. Um, there was a certain building. They had about 50 buildings in Sydney at the time. And um, they were putting some wonderful new technical gear in. And I'm interested in technical gear. And I went and chatted the blokes. And they said, gee, we've got to get this done by next month. I said, why? Because the lease runs out. We have to get out of the building. And they said, don't say it. So I didn't. I'd like to say it now, but I won't. Just thought I'd mention there are other places that have managed to use your money and my money Quite adventurously, I think, is the word we're looking for. The full dimensions of Melbourne's so-called Werribee scam are gradually emerging. It's possible the amount swindled might be as much as $400 million. It's just eight days since the National Crime Authority made its cryptic announcement on the Werribee farm scam. At that stage, it was estimated the scheme could have cost investors $40 million. Since then, our investigations have come up with a long list of people who've had their fingers burnt. The money individuals have lost rolls off the tongue like First Division prizes in Tats Lotto. A city solicitor, $800,000. A Melbourne businessman, again, $800,000. An eastern suburbs couple, $400,000. Taxi driver, $160,000. A suburban solicitor, $100,000.
The Werribee scam has simply exploded. I now know it wound its way across Victoria to farmers and businessmen as far away as Coffs Harbour, branching out to Grafton and Griffith on its way. The whereabouts of the man the NCA wants to speak to, the elusive Joseph Anthony Talia, is still a mystery to police. My contacts say he was in Melbourne yesterday. Others are certain he's in Switzerland. But a look around his former home in Templestowe gives a glimpse of his high rolling lifestyle. The pool and the tennis court dominate the property. The security cameras are covered with cobwebs, but the gardens remain manicured. The events of the last few days have made a lot of people nervous, and many have decided to spill the beans to the NCA. Lena Keneva, 7 News. American Secretary of State George Shultz has opened two days of crucial talks with his Soviet counterpart, Edward Shepanazzi, in Moscow. They're trying to reach agreement on a treaty that would cut by half the number of nuclear weapons in their respective arsenals. With less than six weeks to go before the summit, Secretary of State Schultz and Soviet Foreign Minister Shevardnadze are running out of time as they try to put together a strategic arms agreement. Both superpowers want a treaty reducing the arsenal of intercontinental missiles, but concessions and compromises have been slow in coming. So slow that American officials seriously doubt there will be a treaty for President Reagan to sign when he comes here. But Schultz says he does have a few ideas to offer the Soviets, ideas that Soviet negotiator Viktor Karpov hopes will break the logjam. We expect that Mr. Schultz will bring something to untie the knots that we still have in the preparation for the 50% reduction treaty. Today's meeting comes in the afterglow of last week's Geneva Agreement committing the Soviets to withdraw from Afghanistan. American officials hope the Afghan Accord will be the first of several superpower agreements to cooperate. Sydney took another step towards a petrol shortage tonight. 75 striking stormmen and packers were ordered to return to work at Shell's Rose Hill Terminal in Sydney at 10 o'clock. However, as our pictures show, no one turned up and they now face the sack because they're objecting to company plans to have drivers rather than stormmen load the tanker trucks. Uh, some Shell service stations in Sydney are running low on fuel supplies. There'll be more disruptions for international travellers throughout Australia tomorrow. A Qantas cabin crews decided to stop work only hours after flights returned when air traffic controllers ended their strike. The cabin staff will go out from midnight tonight to meet at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning to discuss work practices and rosters. Qantas is now rescheduling 27 flights and trying to contact 5,000 passengers who will be affected. Wouldn't you like the job of ringing up all the people who will be affected? After about 4,300, you'd want to throw the towel in. More after this. Six men trying to rob a bank in Los Mochis, Los Mochis uh, Mexico, have seized more than 50 hostages, killed four people and demanded safe passage to an undetermined destination. At least 10 others have been wounded in a gun battle between police and gunmen in the bank, 1,300 kilometres northwest of Mexico City. More than 1,000 police have surrounded the bank and authorities are refusing to give in to the bandits' demands. Don't they? I suppose they see the coverage on television, wonderful television of the hostages and the Kuwaiti thing, and they think, what a good idea. 50 hostages and they've killed four. Well, Queen Elizabeth II turned 62 today and the people for a party. Getting into the city's gala event of the year was almost as difficult as getting your hands on an invitation. So I feel a little bit nervous. I think it's just the greatest feeling. 